So in this case, it's not just advice that people are coming forward and asking for when, with their local imam. If they're using the, the arbitration system, um, the, sharia, the, the sharia tribunal system, then essentially whatever the arbitrator decides will be legally binding. It is not really because they can go back to courts if right. they so choose. And for the safeguarding is making sure that Safe. the decisions are public, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Okay. So that you know they're they're subject it's to public scrutiny. It's not legal binding. And that they that have a choice after the arbitration to say no, no I don't well, like the results. It, it is legally binding, but there is um, what what's being called for now mm -hmm. is um, for a greater right of appeal, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. up to date um, the right of appeal has been limited. Yeah. Um, if, and if, if they sign an agreement that this is the decision of the arbitrator is non appealable. Mm -hmm. Then that is fine. Is that usually the case? Uh, no. I saw my understanding in this see, case, see, you can appeal it to a court. See, and a Canadian court has to approve it. If the Canadian court figures there was injustice done, a court could step well, in and change see, it. See, both opponents and proponents, a lot of them don't understand the process of mediation. Mm -hmm. The mediation is purely voluntary and they can walk out anytime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And so this, this is, I mean, uh, available to them. Yeah. That's how it is operated. We're, we're, run, we're running out of time. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to go back to the question from your experience in the Muslim community, men and women, is there mostly for it or against it? What's well, your experience? The community is Muslim Arsifal because the, the, you hear only two or three groups opposing it. The rest of the community is silent. Yes. That, the, is it, that the silent majority? The silent majority is that yes, they want. Uh, uh, they are all in favor. Mm -hmm. They are not opposing it. Yeah. And that represents the uh, almost you can say eighty percent, if not more. What about community. yourself, Nafisa, between you and your friends? Are you for it, or what's uh, the the feeling? Well, I I definitely feel as though it's it enhances the availability of options mm -hmm. um, for people who are looking to resolve their disputes. And options for me is always a good thing. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I think that we need to, as a Muslim community, recognize um, what, what are the drawbacks to the system and the entire idea of informing our own. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's Without key. saying, you know, I, I don't like the word drawbacks because it will mature and there will be problems. Any justice right. system has issues mm -hmm. that will, you know, iron out with time. So we're not saying there exactly. can never be issues. That's, 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 and that's the key point here is that um, if we allowing these tribunals to go ahead gives the Muslim community an opportunity to, to, to mature, to um, see how the system works and to sort of iron out the wrinkles. And I think that's key. It's our own is, sort of jurisprudence. Yeah, the maturity is, exists. Mm -hmm. We have the people have been carrying out mediation and arbitration even before the 1991 that's Act. Fair. Mm -hmm. And Muslim community like is about, I would say, I have lived here since 69. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we are about almost 35 to 40 years old over here, and we have gone through growing pains. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, people have learned from their mistakes in the past, and it ha the mediation has been carried on. Now, number of mosques have been carried out mediation, court-sanctioned mediations. Mm -hmm. That is binding. And people have gone to the court, and the court has upheld the decisions. Okay. We have enough examples from some of the Muslim mediation services that the court has upheld their decision, not overruled. I'm a mediator and arbitrator. I, Most of the arbitration I have done is business. And they have gone to court because one party doesn't like the decision, and the court has upheld the, uh, my, my but, decision. But it's up to the court yeah. to, to upheld it or not, and yeah. that's exactly. a choice. Dina, from yours and your friend's perspective, what do you find? Um, I think that we have all come to a realization that no matter where we live in the world, and you know, we are Canadians, I speak as a Canadian, I, I never say back home because for me there is no home other than Canada, that I have a duty to carry out commandments uh, that I know. I, I have a duty to follow the commandments that have been revealed and, and that's that. And if, if I want to follow that, then I should be given the choice to do so and that's the end of the story. And you know, maybe my, you know, my final say is I would like to be given the choice. I would like to be treated as an intelligent person that given a choice, I hopefully can choose the right thing for myself without somebody telling me, no, you cannot do that because. So please, you know, same as I respect other people's opinion, and I feel those Muslims who feel they don't want to apply it, I respect their opinion. I disagree with it, but I respect. But I'd like them to respect my opinion too, that I would like to adhere to Sharia, ah, and I would like to adhere to this arbitration. So it's a matter of choice. And I please ask those who oppose it, respectively, don't apply to yourself, but please let me have my own choice too. Thank you. We'll take a break. I'd like to thank our panelists, and we'll be back after this break. Welcome back to Spirit of Islam.
Today's topic is women in Islam, and I would like to introduce our new panel, young women who will uh, discuss with us their feelings and their issue about being Muslim women in Canada. Our first guest is Huma Shodri. She's an elementary school teacher and active in, uh, in the social uh, Muslim networks. Our second uh, guest is Sumaya Hussain. She's a journalism student at Ryerson University. And our third guest is Sauda Chan, which has embraced Islam for the last two years. Welcome to you all. Thank you. I guess, you know, in the first part of the show, we talked about Sharia. And alhamdulillah, we've covered quite a few points. And now I would like to discuss with you, as young Muslim women in the community, what are the misconceptions you find about Islam and misconceptions about Muslim women? Maybe we can start with yourself, uh, uh, Um Well, as a teacher, I think one of the main misconceptions people have is that Muslim women are not from Canada. Mm -hmm. Women are only from overseas, which I think is a very skewed um, point of view, which still exists in Canada, which is um, just shows you the fact that a lot of people aren't aware that there are many first generation Muslim women who are active within the community second and now even third generation. Um, and as a teacher I've found that misconception to be there amongst my colleagues as well as the students whom I teach. Any ideas how we can get over this misconception or why do they get? Is it because you're wearing a hijab? Like, you know, what, what's the issue there? Well, I think the main thing as a Muslim woman would be to go out there and become involved mm -hmm. in not just the Muslim community, but the non-Muslim community. And um, once you're involved and once you speak out on different issues and you do some hard work, people realize that um, Muslim women are both active and they're intelligent people and um, they're just the same as everyone else. I guess the idea is to get over that first impression of some, or get over some of these misconceptions. What about yourself, Thumaya? What's your, you know, some of the issues you face? Well, uh, being, uh, being a Muslim woman who's been born in Toronto, um, as, as Homa mentioned, uh, one of the biggest things is, is the fact of being Actually, one of the biggest misconceptions about Islam is about centers around the whole issue of women's rights, and uh, unfortunately, m much of that is projected by media. Mm -hmm. um, being in the journalism field, I'm aware of how uh, people can get a, a wrong impression about uh, about people just through the way they're represented mm -hmm. in the media, and uh, based on the way just the media is uh, is meant to function, it's uh, you know highlights a lot of the negative things because it's all about news and what's newsworthy. Well, so Let me ask you, as a young Muslim woman, and you mentioned that there is a misconception about women's rights, do you feel Islam is taking away any of your rights or do you feel Islam is putting you back in any way as a young Muslim woman? Uh, actually, to the contrary. Uh, Islam gives a lot of, uh, gives women a lot of rights that they, mm -hmm. that they didn't have uh, before Islam came and also uh, being in a Western society, a lot of things that we um, we don't like in terms of, uh, people don't like to see in terms of the way women are treated and exploited. Uh, Islam has protected us from a lot of these things uh, by giving us, you know, this, uh, this model of behavior, this model of how we should be valued. Uh, and the dress code is part of that because the dress code is meant to, uh, to basically foster this sense of respect between men and women and um, just for people to, to be able to mm -hmm function without uh, these problems that come between people. What about yourself, Sauda? Could you share your experience with us? Yes. Uh, leading to what Sumaya had just said, uh, definitely Islam. Um, it's misconception in the West or in Canada is that it oppresses women when in fact it actually liberates women by allowing her to not only have rights in a marriage um, and also in society through wearing hijab um, through covering herself and that's one of the greatest reasons um, for anyone embracing Islam is that they want that liberation independence and it's something that I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, myself as a woman uh, wearing hijab in Canada as a Canadian uh, born in Toronto.